the 2020 budget of economic recovery and resilience. So the question is, how far does it go to achieve this mission? We have lined up an interesting and insightful discussion that seeks to address this question. We will start shortly with a brief opening speech by Mr. Kunle Elibuti, the National Senior Partner of KPMG Nigeria and Chairman KPMG Africa. This will be followed by the welcome address by Chief Chris Okunowo, President and Chairman of Council Institute of Directors, Nigeria. Our lead speaker, Mr. Ayo Salami, Partner Energy and Natural Resources of KPMG will deliver thereafter the keynote address on the Finance Act 2020, the good, the better, and all in between. We will then be calling on our panelists to share briefly their thoughts and perspectives on the paper as it relates to their areas of specialization, which is regulatory for Mr. Sonia Gojubola, who is the Director of Tax Policy at FRS Nigeria. Mr. Ogaga Ologe, who is with us, is the CFO of Cadbury Nigeria PLC, and he will be sharing his thoughts with his area of specialization being the consumer markets industry. For Mr. Akisowo Dawodu, the regional head of Sub-Sahara Africa for Citibank, this will be the financial services industry. And of course, our panelists can also share their general views and comments in addition to their industries as well. Our question and answer segment will follow the panel discussion and you may ask our speakers questions relating to why we're here. To ask the questions, simply put in your questions in the chat box that has been provided on the platform and at the appropriate time, we'll direct them to the appropriate person to answer these questions. We will aim to wrap up and take the vote of thanks to be delivered by Mr. Dele Alimi, Director General and CEO, IOD Nigeria around 1 p.m and thereafter bring the webinar to a close. I would like to warmly welcome every one of us again to this webinar. This is including our distinguished lead speaker and our panelists, our eminent IOD and KPMG executives, and our respectable participants. You are all warmly welcome. I will now call on Mr. Kunle Ilibute, National Senior Partner, KPMG Nigeria, and Chairman, KPMG Africa, to deliver the opening speech. Over to you, Mr. Ilibuti. Nika, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I also, uh, uh, good morning to, to uh, Chief Okunawa, President of the, of the IOD, and all other executives of the IOD. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to, to the IOD leadership for allowing us to partner with you on this very important aspect of, 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 of um, of our fiscal policy and also in 2021 budget, the Finance Act 2020. Um, my initial, you know, uh, plan was to actually, you know, uh, introduce Chief Okunawa, who all of you know very well, and and who is an elder brother to me, and also somebody I, I respect a lot. But unfortunately for us, as, as KPMG, we lost our middle past senior partner, Mr. Shea Bigester, uh, age 69 years old. He passed away yesterday morning in Lagos here. Um, Shei was, you know, he was the previous senior partner of the firm. He had also had the title of chairman of KPMG Africa, and he had practiced as a tax practitioner for 38 years, and was a renowned tax expert in Nigeria. Uh, he was at the forefront of Nigeria's tax policy, uh, fiscal policy as well, and he was passionate about about the, about the things of the economy. Being an economist himself, he graduated from University of Banana in 1973. Um, studying economics and had a master's from York University in Canada. With the permission of the, of the president, Mr. Sihukuno um, said we should, we can observe a one minute silence in the honor of, of, of Shea Bigester. And I'd like you at this point in time, everybody to, uh, let, let's, let's observe one minute silence for, 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 Shea, for Shea from now. Uh, thank you very much.
May the soul of Mr. Shebika Seth rest in perfect peace. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen. Um, you have a fantastic uh, uh, panelist today, and I'm sure that uh, I was my task partner will do justice to the presentation, to the topic, and, uh, and I wish you excellent deliberations throughout today's session. Thank you, sir. Over to you, Chief of Noah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kunele Butet and uh, partners, uh, the KPMG family. I'd like to uh, also commiserate with you the loss of um, the Edith State. And it is our prayer that the good Lord would uh, give him eternal rest. On behalf of the Governing Council and the members and the Skills Deaf Committee of the IOD in Nigeria, I'd like to welcome all of you to this edition, our very first edition of a webinar series uh, 2021. The theme, the good, the better, and all in between. I'd like to also welcome very specially a very distinguished list speaker, Mr. Ayo Salami, uh, partner, Tax Regulatory and People Services of KPMG. And of course, our moderator, our beautiful moderator, Ms. Nika James, uh, was also a partner in tax and the regulatory activities, people services of KPMG. Indeed, I'd like to welcome Mr. Sonia Mojibola, the Director of Tax Policy, Federal Inland Revenue Service. Mr. Ologe, Ogaga Ologe, Chief Financial Officer of Cadbury. Akisha Modaudu, of course, Regional Heads of Southern Africa. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to note that the array of the eminent personalities uh, present at this event. Uh, goes a long way to confirm the importance of this event, not to the an Institute, but to the Nigerian economy as a whole. Our lead speaker, moderator, and panelist brings to us today a, a decades of wealth of experience in the areas of finance and business, money business management, trade and investments, governance and ethics, amongst others. These highly skilled corporate executives, master of business leaders with several years of active experience working in various sectors of the economy, present a formidable team, no doubt. And I'm confident we are going to have a wonderful discussion today. May I also use this opportunity to inform you, or particularly all our guests who are present, that the Institute of Directors Nigeria is the apex professional body in Nigeria with the mandate to cater for and represent directors in their individual capacities across the various sectors of the economy. The Institute has made significant and highly impressive strides, working closely with government, corporate organizations, bilateral chambers, and diplomatic missions to raise the standard of corporate governance and leadership in the private and public sector which has attracted worthy and qualitative members to it. Since the advent of Nigeria's second democratic dispensation, we have intensified our advocacy for the promotion of corporate governance and best practices in all tiers of government, of course, the public and private sectors, with emphasis on the development of the nation's top talent and fostering resourceful and ethical leadership in all the sectors of our economy. We'll continue to intensify our constructive engagement with both government and the private sector for mutual benefit of all stakeholders and the nation at large. As a prime leadership organization, IOD Nigeria helps directors to fulfill their legal and professional responsibilities for the benefit of business and society. Where a not-for-profit membership-based organization that collaborates with and enjoys the support of all regulatory institutions in the country, as well as international multilateral organizations. Furthermore, the Institute is recognized locally and internationally for its leading role in corporate governance practice and advocacy, and has been cited as the most successful professional body in the country with sharp focus in these areas. 
Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the passage of the Finance Act 2020, which we call FA20, is a significant milestone for our country in continuation of the fiscal policy reforms started via the Finance Act of 2019. This marks a conscious return to an era of active fiscal supervision, motivating regular review of the macroeconomic environment and responding to changes as they occur. The amendments introduced by FA520 are meant to enact counter cyclical measures and crisis intervention initiatives, reform fiscal incentive policies to enhance job creation, ensure tax, fiscal responsibility, and public procurement reforms, and facilitate alignment of the country's trade, monetary, and fiscal policies, which are the four thematic areas of the law as enunciated by the government. The FU20, therefore, is intended not only to raise necessary revenue for government required to defray public expenditure, but also to support the citizens in enhancing their disposable income as the country gradually exits the recession. It is further designed to ensure that tax law approvisions are consistent with the national tax policy objectives of the federal government of Nigeria and other laws have an impact on the economy. The aim of this webinar is to therefore explain in detail the implication and changes introduced by the Finance Act of 2020. We see feedback from the stakeholders on their views regarding its effect on public and private sector businesses and clarify any concerns raised during the session. Let me also add that to ensure a successful implementation of the outcome of this event, the Institute will seek or will work with relevant stakeholders and also collaborate with the government in addressing any concerns arising from this event. Our distinguished directors, leaders, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to encourage all of us to be open-minded and participate actively in this webinar. So as to take a full advantage of the enormous wealth of experience of our lead speaker, our panelists, and indeed the moderator. Finally, I appreciate and thank the management of KPMG and IOD Nigeria for the vision to host this webinar. I thank you all for your attention. Good morning. So thank you very much, Chief Okunawa, for the gracious introductions and for sharing with us what the IOD stands for and its objectives and for warmly welcoming us. We are very grateful. So on this note, I would like to call on our lead speaker, Mr. Ayo Salami, Partner Energy and Natural Resources of the Tax Regulatory and People Services Division of KPMG to deliver the keynote address. Over to you, Mr. Salami. Thank you very much. Um... Nikkei for that brief introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today. May I pray the indulgence of the organizers to stand on existing protocol. I hope that is accepted. Okay, it's my pleasure to be here to share with you my perspectives on the topic, Finance Act 2020, the good, the better, and all in between. I'll structure this presentation in four parts. Next slide. So I will look at the thematic areas of the Finance Act, and thereafter, I will talk briefly about the economic imperatives and key drivers for the law, and then move on to discuss some of the key provisions which the law brought to the fiscal space. And then I will round up with uh, looking at the implications for business and as well as for our economy. Next slide. So uh, what are the thematic areas of Finance Act 2020? We all recall that last year, the country was thrown into a recession, the second in four years, consequent upon the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. In response to that, the executive proposed an economic stimulus bill for about 2.3 trillion naira to the National Assembly. Unfortunately, that bill was not passed. It was meant to basically alleviate the impact of the pandemic and stimulate the economy, but it wasn't passed. So what the executive then did was basically to disintegrate that bill 
and then take some of these provisions and include in the Finance Act 2020, FA 20 for short. So as it were, Finance Act 2020 is staged across four thematic areas. One, enacting counter cyclical measures and crisis intervention initiatives. Secondly, reforming the fiscal incentives policies for job creation. And then thirdly, to look at the tax, fiscal responsibility and procurement reforms. And then lastly, but not the least, to check the alignment of our trade, monetary and fiscal policies. On the first one, the, one of the pillars of the enacting countercyclical measures and crisis intervention initiative, initiative was basically enacting legal framework for the creation of a crisis intervention fund, which hopefully the president can tap into whenever there's a crisis of this nature in future, and then use the funds in that, in that same fund to basically um, spend and ride the country out of such crisis. Another pillar of that initiative is introducing provisions to allow for the tax recovery of donations made towards the pandemic and any other potential job crisis. And I think this is quite important because government alone cannot solve such problems when it occurs in future. So what the government tries to do is to then encourage individuals and corporate entities to support government in that initiative and then give them a palliative by allowing whatever donations they have made to support government as tax deductible for their corporate tax purposes. The second thematic area is reforming fiscal incentive policies for job creation. The major anchor of this thematic area is incentivizing operators in this sector towards being efficient and towards the growth of that sector. And how does the government intend to do this? One, they intend to provide support for mass transit by reviewing the current duties and VAT regimes for the transportation sector as a whole. Targeting areas like commercial aircraft, motor vehicles, buses, and trucks, particularly for agricultural production. The third thematic area is tax, fiscal responsibility, and procurement reforms. And in a way, the focus of this thematic area is a continuation of what I call the unfinished business of FA19. So how do they intend to do this? By amending key tax legislation to implement tax reforms, to also amend aspects of the Fiscal Responsibility Act as it relates to our, our, our funding in the country, and also look at the procurement, procurement, public procurement acts to implement key procurement reforms in the sector. Lastly, but not the least, the fourth thematic area is alignment of our trade, monetary, and fiscal policies. And in here, the intent is to ensure that there's an alignment between and among these three policies, to ensure that both the three policies are in line toward the same policy direction. And this is quite important because any misalignment may potentially cause disruption in the system. And I'll give a very good example. Two years ago, in 2019, we did have um, a tax policy, I mean, a tax law, which which, which, which stipulates that companies engaged in export trade are going to be tax-free. They're going to have a tax-free income from their export proceeds, provided two conditions are met. One, they must portray that proceeds in the country, and the proceeds must be used to procure plant and equipment for the operation. By the instrument of Finance Act 19, one of that condition was removed, which was the requirement to repatriate the funds into the country because it became onerous for those exporters and they built a sigh of relief. Unfortunately, I must say, just last month, we saw some circular from the CBN stipulating that all exporters must repatriate their proceeds into the country. So you can see that there's a kind of policy some assault. And um, if this continues, definitely it will affect and distort business operation in the country. So these are the kind of things that this fourth thematic area is meant to to cover, particularly with respect to ease of doing business. So on an overall basis, FA 2020 brought in over eight amendments to 14 tax laws. And see that it's very extensive. If we're going to, we're going to do a deep dive analysis of each of these amendments, we'll probably need a whole day workshop to do that. But what I've done in this my presentation is basically to focus on those key areas that should be of interest to directors and policymakers on this call. So 
What are the economic imperatives and key drivers for finance at 2020? Starting with the economic imperatives, one positive point that happened to the country last year was that we moved on the ease of doing business from 146 level to 131. We moved 15 points, which is a very good improvement. Again, maybe not unconnected with various policy initiatives adopted by the government. Unfortunately, though, our tax to GDP ratio remained at 5.7 and is very low. This is what so if you then compare our level with the average of 17.2% across 26 African countries surveyed by the OECD in 2017. It means this is an area there's a lot of room for improvement as a country. Unfortunately, too, inflation rates skyrocketed to about 14.89% as of end of last year. This wasn't good enough at all. And the CBN maintained NPR at 11.5% last year, which started around September last year. These statistics are not fantastic for a, 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 an economy like Nigeria. And so it means we're actually struggling. And therefore, it wasn't a surprise that the government is trying to implement an expansionary budget in 2021, which will see the government spending close to 13.59 trillion naira by of expenditure, as against budgeted income of 7.99 trillion, which of course means we're going to have a fiscal deficit of 5.6 trillion naira. Now, government intends to uh, finance that through both external and internal borrowing. We'll see how that pans out in the course of the year. Now, looking at the Finance Act itself, 2020, what are the key drivers? Now, the government did comment, commit to Nigerians that they will not, as it were, introduce new taxes in a year, and neither will they introduce new incentives. Um, as I go on in my presentation, we we'll evaluate how feasible that was and how it will be. Also, they did confirm that tax reforms that support financial stimulus will be put in place. So also, the government intends to pronounce tax measures that are short, focused, and some controversial, so that it's easier for everyone to um, understand and therefore implement. So that's to say that the Fiscal Policy Reform Committee Where's the set up Go. by the government um, is a standing committee uh, under the oh. under the purview of the oh, 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 budget, okay. finance, and national planning. So that committee is a standing committee, and um, obviously they are there to invest all inputs and contributions from stakeholders for the robust passage of subsequent finance acts. So it's important to note this. Next slide. So what are the key reforms brought about by Finance Act 2020, FA 2020? I've tried to bucket this into two categories to align with the theme of this presentation the good and the better on the one hand, and then all in between on the other hand. So starting with the good and the better, what I have of me on this slide are six major reforms brought about by Finance Act 2020. And I'll go through them um, one, one after the other, subject to time permitting. The first is revised minimum tax. Before 2020, the minimum tax regime in Nigeria is a bit complex to the extent that um, companies were made to pay, as it were, taxes on capital rather than income. So what FA19, last year's finance act then did, was to abrogate that complex system, which is unfair, and introduce simple model for company minimum tax, which is just 0.5% of turnover. However, again, in response to the pandemic, what the government did was to say, look, the country is reeling from the impact of the pandemic, so also are corporate taxpayers. Therefore, we will reduce the minimum tax rate from 0.5% to 0.25%. For tax returns prepared and filed for any year of assessment falling between 1 January 2020 and 24 December 2021, a space of two financial years. That is the intent of the government to alleviate the suffering of corporate entities under the influence of the pandemic. The other key reform brought about by the Act was the introduction of deductible donations. Uh, and we all witnessed that last year, COVID was very paramount. They were very important. They, were, they, they carried out some key, key, key uh, um, initiatives in respect of um, alleviating suffering of um, those adversely impacted by COVID. 
So what government is doing this year and going forward is to say donations to such initiatives, then at the federal government level or state government level, by corporate entities and individuals will now become tax deductible in determining their corporate and personal income taxes at the end of the year in order to encourage corporate entities and individuals to support government in this kind of initiative. The third reform, I would say, is the, um, a, a continuation of what happened last year, Finance Act 19, with respect to agricultural production. So what the Finance Act 2020 is trying to do now is to clearly stipulate that the tax exemption on interest payable to banks for agricultural loans now limited to loans advanced to businesses engaged in primary agricultural production. Before now, there was a loose term loose used in tax law with respect to agricultural trade, which of course was open to interpretation, different interpretations by tax authorities as well as uh, entrepreneurs in agricultural trade. It was extended to as, uh, to, to as far as agro life businesses and, and so on and so forth, which created a kind of confusion um, in the industry. So what FA 2020 has tried to do is to then refine the applicability of this incentive to only primary agricultural production as defined in the Finance Act. And then additional incentive was subject to a 12 month moratorium rather than 18 months in previous law as was previously contained in previous law. Yeah. So primary agricultural production was restricted, defined to mean primary crop production, primary livestock production, primary forest production, and primary fish production. So it's clear to every, everybody, which is very, uh, very, very good. The fourth item here is software as QCE. Um, before, this was an item that typically companies try to amortize over the cost uh, in the course of the, of the year, but the laws are now clear. We would have to claim capital analysis on QCE incurred on software, which is going to be aligned with the, 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 the hardware itself. The next one is tax return for small companies. FA 2020 allows FIS to prescribe alternative forms of account that may be submitted by small and medium-sized companies. Before, before now, the tax study requests such companies to produce audited accounts to support their tax returns. Again, in alignment with the provision of KAMA, which has simply reduced the, 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 the final requirement for small companies, it is therefore important to align the provision of this tax law with this, such that small companies are no longer required to have a corporate auditor and then have other accounts to support their income tax returns. Again, in continuation of the reform last year, which uh, made small companies tax-free on their income, up, what FA 2020 also then does is to extend that to tertiary education tax, which was not captured last year. So from this year and going forward, small companies are defined under FA 20, 2019, which are companies that earn revenue below 25 million naira per annum, will no longer require to also pay tertiary education tax. The last but not the least on this slide is incentives granted to real estate investment companies, which was uh, by virtue of FA19, but priority is now being brought to it to the extent that real estate investment companies who earn dividends and rental income on behalf of their beneficiaries will no longer be subject to tax on that income. It will only be subject to tax at one level when they are distributed to the beneficiaries. I think that priority was very, very important to have been made. Next slide. Moving forward, still on key reforms, um, the other one introduced was the competition for lots of office, which was actually introduced last year. Again, there were, there were confusion as to whether if an employee that has been disengaged that earns over 10, 10 million naira by a way of competition for lots of office, how much of that will be subject to CGT? There were confusion as to whether it is excess or it's everything. And what FA 2020 has come to clarify is that in that case, it's only the excess over 10 million naira that will be liable to CGT, which is very, very important. Um, we also have tax exemption granted to minimum wage earners. For obvious reasons, these are the most vulnerable sector of the, of the economy. And what the law, what the government is trying to do is to ensure that that disposable income is enhanced by making that tax free, provided you are in paid employment and you earn salary that is equal or less than minimum wage as stipulated in the Minimum Wage Act. The third one on this slide is incentive for air travel business. Again, it's trying to incentivize operators in this sector towards inefficiency and growth. 
So what F20 is trying to which has proposed is that commercial airlines like in Nigeria may now import, purchase, or lease aircraft into the country together with engines and spare parts and components duty free without paying import duty. And by way of extension, also VAT free. Those items can be put into the country without payment of VAT. And then finally, airline tickets sold by commercial airlines in Nigeria are also VAT exempt from 2021 going forward. Also, relating to the transport sector, like I said earlier on, well, it's also said, look, from 2021 upwards, they have reduced the import duty on mass transit vehicles for transporting more than 10 persons from the previous rate of 35% to 10%. And that on tractors, basically used by agricultural producers from 35% to 5%. And of course, for individuals like you and I, on cars imported from 30% to 5%. Hopefully, government expects that this should drive down the cost of logistics across board. If you recall, Manufacturing Association of Nigeria have actually cried out loud to say, if you look at the cost component of most, most, most producers in Nigeria today, most, most manufacturers, logistics cost stands out as a major cost aiding. And I think with these kind of initiatives, you should experience some reduction in that and then higher profitability. I don't think correspondence uh, before now, we've always engaged the tax authorities via emails, but there was no legal framework to support or to enhance FIS ability to do that. What FA20 has then done is to introduce some legal provisions to that effect. And then lastly on this slide is a clarification brought about by um, the FA20 regarding agricultural production under the Income Tax Relief Act which is the Pioneer Status Act. In, in essence, FA20 introduces power agricultural production as a pioneer product to qualify for an initial tax-free period of four years, renewable for additional period of two years, subject to meeting some criteria. And of course, the other condition is then that those that are granted Pioneer Status must be agricultural products, products, primary agricultural producers who are small and medium-sized companies pursuant to the application to the president through the minister. So as it were, these are these basic, so the, 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 key, the key reforms brought about by, by Finance Act 2020. Moving on, um, this slide talks about the all in between, i.e. those that you neither can say in real sense, are they incentives or were they tax, tax, new tax, tax, uh, taxes. So the first on this slide is simply the economic presence, which was a term or a concept introduced by FA19, but this time around, it's been extended to non-resident individuals, trustees, executors that provide regional and management services to Nigerian persons via internet or via digital means. And I think it's important just to make sure that they are all aligned at the corporate level and personal level. And FA10 2020 also then to clarifies that withholding task is a final task for persons who have SCP in Nigeria by virtue of remotely providing such services to Nigerian recipients. I think it's very important so that the tax net is widened and any loophole has currently been experienced by such services are blocked. The second item here is the tightening of international shipping companies, ISCs. Before now, we've had a provision in section 14 of CETA, which stipulates that such companies will be taxed at, at, at best 2% of their freight income. Of course, there was confusion as to what if they earn non freight income, right? So what FA20 has then done is to clarify that yes, income from leasing containers, non freight operations, and any other incidental income will be left to tax under the general tax code of 30% on actual profit or 6% of deemed profit, no longer the general 2% which is applicable to such companies. Again, this in a way is um, to plug any potential tax leakage arising from operation of such companies. Going forward, we also have um, the third one, tax compliance requirements for non-resident companies. I must say that uh, what FA20 has done is to actually reinforce the provision of the of section 55 of existing tax law. So essentially, where non-resident companies earn income from Nigeria that is only left to withholding tax, they will continue not to file audited accounts or tax returns. However, where the end income for which the total tax is not the final tax liability, 
they will now be required to file their global account as well as the account of their Nigerian operation audited by a Nigerian qualified accountant. And lastly, they are supposed to register for VAT and file monthly VAT returns as part of the advance plan. Again, this is not strange because it is what happens in other jurisdictions. Um, the government is trying to plug all possible um, avenues for tax leakage. And I think by making such companies file those returns, they come under the purview. Some, most of the transactions come under, under the visible visibility to, to the FRS. Lastly, on this slide is the tax compliance requirement for companies operating in a free trade zone. Before now, such companies were completely exempted from tax provisions and tax limitations in the country, but it is designed as um, a tax free area. So, what the FA 2020 has done is to say, look, yes, we will not withdraw the incentive granted to you by making your operations tax free. However, you must submit income tax returns in accordance with Station 55 of CETA such that your operations become visible to the FRS. And in a way, FRS can begin to build its database of all companies operating in Nigeria, irrespective of their tax status, and then be able to leverage that to make informed decisions going forward. Next slide. So moving forward, what also CFA 20, uh, 2020 does is to also expand the scope of excise duty. FA 20 resigns the excise duty exemption on imported excisable goods and raw materials not available in Nigeria introduced last year. Therefore, going forward, all accessible goods, either cigarettes, wines, and all of that important to the country, and those produced locally will now be subject to excise duty. And I think in a way it provides a level playing field for all producers and operators. And lastly, F20 also introduced a framework for subjecting telecom services provided in Nigeria to excise duty. Now it has only provided the framework, it has not provided details or modalities as to how to do that, which the president is expected to do in the course of the year. Um, we also have replacement of stamp duty on electronic transactions. Uh, this was just last said, stamp duty on electronic transactions. What every 20 has done is to replacing re that tax or levy into uh, electronic money transfer levy instead of stamp duties. And of course, also acknowledges the fact that FRS must then use aggressive stamps issued by NAPOS to stamp their documents. Again, this also is to resolve the, the dispute between FRS and NAPOS as to who has authority over stamp duties and stamp collection. Thirdly, I mentioned the crisis intervention fund, LRON, it's a special fund created out of the Consented uh, Revenue Fund of the Federation, as well as special accounts, which meant to provide some pool, pool of funds present to ad address any emergencies in case of, of, of in case they occur. A sub fund of that fund is the Unclaimed Fund Trust Fund, which um, is meant to, in a way, uh, provide a pool of funds from unclaimed dividends of public limited liability companies put it on NEC and utilized amounts in dormant bank account that have remained so for six years to be transferred to the fund immediately effective January this year. So it's in essence, unlike before, where companies uh, were at liberty after 12 years to basically um, return such unclaimed dividends into the general pops and distribute to existing shareholders, what the trend has done is to say, look, after six years, such money must be paid into this fund. And also for banks, all their dormant bank account holders, after six years of opening such account or transacting that account, must return to that fund. And it's a debt owed by government to those people. The fund is managed by the debt management office, and owners of the unclaimed dividends or unutilized amount in the dormant bank account may, may make a claim together with any accrued income on the fund at any time. I think this is good, it's inconsistent with the question of our constitution, which frowns at an inappropriate um, um, taking over of people's property. On capital against tax filing obligations, FA20 then clarifies also that this filing must be done twice a year, unlike before now, where it is aligned with um, CITA, the Company Income Tax Act. So there's a specific question now regarding filing of capital against tax returns every 30 June, obviously for transactions between January and June. And then for transaction between July and December by the first December of that year. Again, clarity as to final obligations and timing. Lastly, on this slide is um, gas incentives in the downstream oil and gas sector. This incentive was introduced last year, but there was also a confusion as to is it applicable to the company or to the trade? What FA20 has then done is simplify it and clarify that it now applies to the trade or business of gas utilization in the downstream operation of a company. In other words, 
a company can engage in such trade and other trades without being denied incentives, which was the case before now. This was between the taxpayers and the tax authorities. Lastly, on all in between, we have um, provisions in the Fiscal Responsibility Act speaking to um, um, budget deficits. We also have provisions in the Public Procurement Act speaking to government contracts. And it is just say that uh, maximum mobilization fee for government contracts have been increased from 15% to 30%, obviously, perhaps to enhance the quick startup of such, 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 uh, such projects. And bank guarantee or insurance bond issued by an accepted institution still being required at least to provide some kind of support and then confidence. And then in lieu of the performance guarantee, an insurance bond may also be accepted as the condition for the award of the procurement contract and the payment of the mobilization fees. And such guarantee or bond must not be less than 10% of the contract value. These are part of the controls government is trying to put in place when it comes to public procurement. On budget deficits, uh, we see the FA20 amending the Fiscal Responsibility Act to the extent that it now expands instances where aggregate expenditure may exceed estimated aggregate revenue, that's a budget deficit, by more than 3% of estimated GDP, to include when the Federation is at war or imminent danger of invasion, or there's a clear and present danger of breakdown of public order or public safety. Before now, it wasn't that very clear and then lucid in the Finance and Finance and Fiscal Responsibility Act. So again, it also provides for a spending limit for each statutory corporation by limiting the cost to revenue ratio of each corporation to 50% or such other ratio as minister may direct subject to a product of national assembly. The other sense of this is to ensure that corporations are run in, 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 in a sense more efficiently, if not profitably, and that they don't go overboard in spending and they must account for such um, operation to the minister. Lastly on this slide is the use of technology, which I spoke earlier on about. Um, the FA now empowers the FRS in, in the area of deployment of technology to collect tax information and ease of tax administration, marked by an introduction of a penalty regime for tax officials who breach taxpayer confidentiality by sharing information with unauthorized third parties. Again, this is very important because tax information is confidential and must be kept so by all parties. Again, FRS now is permitted to deploy proprietary or third party payment processing or other digital platform or application to collect and remit taxes due on the traditional transaction in supply of digital services supplied remotely or to or from the person in Nigeria. And lastly, the logic means of correspondence now backed by law. Tax and pitch are now permitted to conduct virtual tax proceedings, which is not the case before now. And I think, again, it's a response to the pandemic. And I think we're all moving in that direction. Next slide. So rounding up, what are the implications of what all I've said on business and on the economy as a whole? On business, I, my sense is that there's potentially going to be reduction in logistics costs due to the various initiatives around tax exemption status of transportation vehicles, airlines, and the rest. So expectedly, it should come down. Secondly, um, I see a high survival rate of small-scale enterprises due to the tax-free operations and low compliance requirements occasioned by both finance as 19 and as also expounded by FA 2020. So the compliance requirement has now been reduced. No more requirement to file that accounts. You're not going to pay tax on your revenue if you, you end up below 25 million per annum in turnover and all of that. So survival, survival rate is going to increase, and hopefully that should help to jumpstart the economy because the growth of emerging economies like ours is inched on the growth of the small scale industry. And then potential increment in telecoms cost when telecom service becomes excisable. I did mention that if you're trying to provide a framework for the introduction of telecoms, um, of um, some tasks on telecom services in the country, which is also in line with what happens other, in some other African countries, Rwanda, Uganda, for instance. So when the government, when the president does come out with that, with the modalities for this, um, for this uh, tax or levy, uh, we may see a slight increment in our telecoms cost across board. Um, on the economy, I see the um, reforms around agricultural production enhancing output and ultimately potential reduction in food prices, all things being equal. Um, again, the development of the real estate, real estate segment of the economy as project economies become more favorable with reduction in project payback period. I see this happening, given that um, 
really letting them complain will no longer be taxed on the income that they are made for their beneficiaries and not on their own. So obviously, uh, we should see some improvement in the in project, project economies and therefore the development of this sector. And lastly, but not the least, I will see, for instance, an increase in administrative body of managing public companies stakeholders. Remember that we talked about the unclaimed dividend um, fund earlier on. It then means that for every publicly quoted companies, they need to put in place structures to track their unclaimed dividends every year, which obviously means increased um, costs. Um, on this note, I would like to pause, and I think um, I hope I'm still within time. I'd like to pause and hand about to Mika James and then take questions thereafter. Thank you very much for your attention. It's a pleasure being here. Okay. So thank you very much, Mr. Salami, for dissecting the Finance Act and extraing its provisions along the lines of the good, the better, and all those in between. Your presentation has raised several issues, and I'm sure our participants and the teaming audience would like to ask. In fact, I can see some of the questions already dropping in um, on VAT, minimum tax, and the rest. So I'm going to ask our participants, please, don't stop, keep penning down your questions in the Q&A box, preferably than the chat box. Use the Q&A box and put down your questions. We'll be coming down to them in a moment. But before then, we'd like to quickly move into the panel discussion segment where our panelists will share their views on the paper that's just been presented on the Finance Act by Mr. Salami. And we'd like to start with our industry specialists so that they can provide their views you know, and um, before we call on our tax regulator who's with us. So firstly, I'll be calling on Mr. Akinsonwo Dawudu, the regional head, Sub-Sahara Africa for Citibank. So over to you, Mr. Dawudu. Um, thank you, Nike, and thanks everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Okay, um, I'd like to congratulate uh, Mr. Salami on an excellent presentation. Um, that raised a few issues in addition to some of in addition to some of the things that I had wanted to speak about. I think firstly, we have to take this from a macro broader view perspective before I talk about some of the details that pertain to the financial financial services industry in particular. I think the fact that the act, the FAA Financial Act of 2019, was the first in 20 years of its kind was really a monumental change. And the fact that this 2020 version was completed on time is a really positive signal, I think, to the, to the market and to uh, the environment, uh, to the stakeholders in the Nigerian economy. Um, essentially, the economy is a living and breathing thing. It changes, it adapts, it moves. The fiscal space, the details of what people of, of what people are doing, of activity is changing all the time. And you can't have a static uh, regulatory or legal environment uh, in the face of such dynamism. And I think the idea of reviewing the Finance Act regularly, I mean, last two years, but certainly much more regularly than before, is a fantastic one that will allow a proper response to this. And, you know, I'd like to highlight a couple of things um, that uh, Mr. Sami talked about, I think are very, very relevant. The counter-cyclical measures that we are taking to protect the economy in the midst of a pandemic um, and using some of the tax um, provisions to achieve that end. Uh, we saw many countries do this, uh, trying to create some sort of stimulus, trying to create some sort of um, put cash in people's hands and allow people to be able to continue to drive economic activity even in the midst of uh, a pandemic. And Nigeria was no different. The, the lack of fiscal space complicates it a little bit because our ability to run um, very, very large deficits is constrained by our own historic uh, challenges in terms of uh, the fiscus. But at least that element was there. And the point of reviewing this every year gives you the space and the ability to respond to those kind of circumstances. And then from a banking perspective, I think the ease of doing business aspect of things 
cannot be underestimated. And I'm glad that that was highlighted as well. Nigeria did move up from 146 to 131 on the ease of doing business ranking. But there are other rankings as well. If you look at the World Economic Forum competitiveness ranking, we continue um, to struggle in that area. <clears throat> and it's a giant competition in the world. And we're competing with Kenya, with Ghana, with South Africa, with Egypt, people in our neighborhood. And we have to constantly look at where we are on these rankings, not just in, abs in uh, nominal terms, but also in relative terms to um, the other countries that I talked about and others that we are competing with. And I think um, the point of things like, of reviewing the Finance Act regularly helps us to compete better and to get to adapt to the changes we need to adapt to and get the investments we need um, to, to, to grow the economy and get uh, the attention that we need as a country. So I think that aspect can't be overestimated. And you see, you can approach it from a perspective of, oh, we're 146 now, there's a checklist. If we pass this legislation and pass this legislation and enact this bill, we can move up. And that's good, that shows focus. That shows um, sort of a mechanistic approach, but you can also approach it in terms of the spirit of ease of doing business, which is at some stage, if we enact enough of these reforms, the business doing business should actually get easier. So it's not just about moving up a ranking. You know you've succeeded when your, the practitioners tell you that doing business actually becomes easier. And again, that's speaking to the spirit of it. And I think this process is part of that. I mean, being able to engage with tax authorities electronically and you know, being served a notice or assessment electronically, this is recognizing things that are changing, um, significant uh, economic presence for people who are working, who are performing services in Nigeria remotely. I mean, doing it remotely, but for Nigerian entities. Um, the, the, the little, little things that you need to do regularly to reflect what's going on um, in, in the economy, I think it's fantastic that this act is, is doing that. Coming to finance in particular, I think there have been a few changes in the 2020 edition that do impact, that does impact um, the financial sector. Uh, you talked about insurance companies and the minimum um, minimum tax rates being cut in half from 0.5% to 0.25%. That's good. Um, insurance is a very, very uh, much a challenge sector in Nigeria. Only 0.33% penetration, which is very low even compared to other um, countries of our type. In, in the sub-Saharan Africa continent. So that change is important. And another sign of progress is that in the 2019 Act, there were some changes in the financial, uh, Finance Act of 2019, there were some changes that affected insurance. And in this edition, in this um, uh, 2020 Act, there has been building on that platform. So last year, gross premium and uh, gross income, I think was not properly defined. In the 2020 version of the Finance Act, it is. Um, unearned income was taxable in 2020, in 2019, in the 2019 Act. In this year's version, it is not. All these things, these incremental changes, progress is slow, progress is gradual. But these incremental changes over time will add up to a revolution, really, and a sea change. And you do see that on the finance. Um, side. There's also some regulation around common uh, reporting standards, uh, which is important. You talked, we also talked about the Greek primary Greek sector moratorium um, in terms of uh, the fact that loans to that sector, to the primary Greek sector, will be tax, will be tax exempt. Very important as well because the discussion around the Greek and uh, uh, improving our food security is very topical now and this impacts banks obviously because banks are extending the loans and there's a significant carryover from last year in terms of the finance act of last year dealing with the excess dividend tax provisions 
that really uh, made an impact in terms of double taxation and in terms of allowing tax exempt income to be recognized and to be benefited from um, by, by investors and companies in the economy. This affects banks particularly because most banks have a significant portfolio in government securities, treasury bills, and bonds. And some of those tax exempt benefits were somewhat offset by the excess um, dividend tax provisions, which have, you know, subject to the uh, attribution of costs related to that tax exempt uh, uh, revenue, which have now been eased. And, and that's good. 2021 is going to be interesting in that regard for the industry because uh, the tax exempt status of treasury bills was gazetted in 2011. And I think it's 10 years. I'm not sure whether it applies to bonds as well. I think it might do, but certainly for bills. So that comes up for, uh, that expires next year. It'll be interesting to see what the fiscal response to that is. And hopefully further iterations of the Finance Act will address that in no uncertain terms as well. So I think there are lots of, uh, uh, details to to pour over software expenditure now being a qualifying uh, capital expenditure. This, this this is important and uh, this is this is this is very positive. And I think for the sector overall, the impact of the 2019 and 2020 edition of the Finance Act has been positive. But it's just a building block. Um, we're all hopeful that in the years to come, we will build on this to to further improve the flexibility of our finance laws and our tax laws. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Mr. Dawoju. That was a very good dissecting within that little period of time. And I can't but note that um, you've commended that this trend of annual reviews is a first in like 20 years, so the government should continue. And that the counter cyclical measures are welcome in order to help the economy out of the pandemic. And same as what other countries are doing. People are putting palliatives in terms of cash into the hands of their citizens, but we really don't have a lot of headroom to do much of that in terms of um, taking a lot of budget deficit. So thank you very much. And we, we're happy we've seen progress in the FS industry coming from FY Finance Act 2019 to 2020. 2020, the financial, the insurance industry, excess dividend tax and the rest of that. So we appreciate that um, deep dive you've been able to do on the Finance Act within this uh, short period of time. So we'll now call on our next panelist, Mr. Ogaga Ologe to share his thoughts and perspectives with us. I know he's from the same industry, he's the CFO of Cadre Nigeria PLC, so he may have a bias towards that. But beyond the F uh, CM industry, he's also uh, welcome to share his general views as well. Over to you. Mr. Luge. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mike James. Thank you very much. And um, thank you, Mr. Ayo Salami, for making that Finance Act look very simple to read. At first, when I was reading through the Finance Act, it, it wasn't an easy thing for me to digest. But looking at your presentation, it seems easy for, for anyone to comprehend then the, the details of the Finance Act. I think, I think um, we all know that 2020 was a tough year for, for everyone, especially those in the manufacturing sector. We saw a lot of impact coming from the, the devaluation of the FX. We also saw a lot of impact coming from increased costs in view of the, the pandemic we had. And also, of course, we lost some um, significant volumes in terms of revenue. So it was really, really tough for, for those of us in the, in the manufacturing sector. But seeing the Finance Act, that is, there's some breathing space there. If I look at the, the, the of course, it's not, it's not nice for people to lose their jobs, but um, unfortunately, when you when you now um, try to increase the the um, the exempt from CGT from ten thousand to ten million, it shows how realistic that is and and how practical that is and and that is a very good step in the right direction. If I also go into the CIT space, the the fifty percent reduction in minimum tax is actually important. We all know that every most companies in the manufacturing sector would utilize their entire capital allowances, and as such, they might not be. They may not be. They may not have enough um, um, tax to pay in terms of the fact that they have lots of um, um, capital allowances. So they are definitely subjected to to minimum tax by default. So reducing that minimum tax in a time when that when things are tough in that in that in that part of the economy, it's something that is in the right direction. So looking at what we paid in my own company last um, last last year, comparing to what what we paid this year, that's a significant drop, and that that's a good one in spite of in view of the, the, the difficulties that are surrounding the, the economy right now. 
And, and the, the case of donations that you mentioned, it was a good one because many a times, if, uh, as a corporate entity, if you make donations and those donations are now liable for tax deduction, especially in terms of the, the, what, the, what the Finance Act mentioned, which is on for pandemic, natural disaster, or other exigency, these are now liable for deduction. So most, com most corporate institutions would now be willing to actually support the government in addressing the, the needy part of the economy. And, and that is a good one. And I, I think that is, a, that, is a, that is a positive step in the right direction. And the tax exemption, like uh, Mr. Taudu mentioned, the interest exempt from agricultural law is also something very good. So it means that they are also developing that, that part of the part of the, the economy. And looking at looking at one important aspect is the allowing um, allowing courier service email or other electronic means to communicate with the tax authority is something very good because many a times you get you get some papers or letters from them. It takes a while to get to to your office, you send your correspondence, it takes a while for your, for, your, for your letter to also get to them. But the email correspondence, email exchanges between the FRS, the LRS, or the, the tax authorities, between the tax authorities and companies, I think, I think it's, it's, it's actually ease of doing business in Nigeria, because this is one of the tough aspects that we, we in the industry are actually passing through, trying to, trying to respond to queries from the tax authorities. So now I think it will be, it will be very, very fast, and, and, and probably we, we won't have Long outstanding claims or long outstanding audits or, or long outstanding um, um, letters to respond or, or issues to deal with, with tax authorities. Now, looking at also some other aspect that you mentioned, the, the, the one that talks about um, the, the duty rates, I think that is also very good for, for, for it, it certainly is going to reduce cost of um, logistics in, in this sector, which is something that, which, which, is, which we show that the government is actually listening to some of the, the complaints that the, the citizens are raising. Now, the only thing that, um, that I felt maybe came too early was the, I'm not sure you mentioned, was the redefinition of um, the gross income for CRA relief when calculating the personal income tax. That relief, the, the definition has been redefined. And that means that tax has increased, tax has certainly increased for, for taxpayers. That is the only, the only area that, uh, that, um, that people did not really like. But of course, it's, it's, it is necessary, but I probably, it could have come in another, in another version of the of the finance act maybe that's because right now people are still are still feeling the impact of the pandemic and this certainly would mean that mean that their tax um, their, their their tax um the amount of tax that they will pay will, will certainly go up but look at the finance act in general for for companies itself i, I think it's i think it's a good one i, I think the fact that um, um the fact that um, the cgt the cit the income tax and those things have, have reduced is, is something that most people would, most taxpayers would even be willing to, to pay, and they'll be happy doing that. So from the, from the, from the manufacturing sector, I feel it's a good one. And, um, and I, I think the government should continue to listen, to, listen to, um, to, to, to corporate institutions like this so that businesses will continue to thrive in Nigeria. And that, and that, and that means that, um, more, tax to, to more, tax, more tax will be paid to, to, to the government. So that, these are the few points I would, I would like to talk about on, on the finance, how it affects our industry. But it's a good one, and, and I guess we are all happy about it. Okay, so thank you very much, Mr. Loge. And uh, we take note that you said Mr. Salami did a good justice in making the act really look simple and um, easy to follow. And generally, the act has been beneficial to the consumer market with reductions and like minimum tax donations, but there's still a negative point in terms of for that for the employees. Consolidated relief allowance, that is a big issue. And I'm happy at this point that our um, regulator, uh, FRS representative, has had a chance to listen to Mr. Salami, Mr. Dawoodu, and Mr. Loge, so that in getting the feedback from Mr. Bojubola as well, you know, he, he would have a benefit to also maybe try to address some of these things that we are listening to. So at this point, I would like to call on Mr. Bojubola, Mr. Sonia Bojubola, who is the Director of Tax Policy at FRS to share his own views as well. So over to you, Mr. Bojibola. Thank you very much, um, Linke, and thanks uh, my co-panelists. And I want to um, appreciate uh, Mr. Salami for a very wonderful presentation. Uh, please let me seek the indulgence of um, uh, colleagues and attendants that I'll be switching up my video. Um, my uh, internet source uh, is not very stable. 
Um, so just to reduce the amount of um, bandwidth that I'll be consuming. So please uh, indulge me to switch up my video uh, going forward. Um, number two, um, Nikki, I don't know how much time I have. Please, so that I don't run off course, can you just tell me what is my limit? Nikki, are you able to hear me? Um, what is my limit for time? Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I was muted and I was talking. I said we, we can give you like 10 minutes, please, to share your views. 10 minutes? Yes. Okay. Okay. We can use less that's, than that's that right. if you can, that's, but that's try not to use more than that. Um, <laughs> number one, uh, that's, that's all right. Uh, a little bit of um, caveat um, is that I will limit myself to only the tax issues uh, in the FA 2020. Uh, I will not go into uh, issues that are not tax related uh, since um, I'm essentially um, speaking here as a tax person. Um, now, the FA 2020, and I really thank all my previous speakers who have commended the government um, for having the Finance Act now coming in regularly. Um, in year 2020 FA, uh, the general tax principle Hello, Mr. Agwadubala, we've lost you. Mr. Agwadubala, we can't hear you again. We've lost you. Um, Hello, are you back, Mr. Abodjibola? I think we'll just give him a few moments to see um, if he can come back. Nikkei, we may we may have to uh, in the interim uh, maybe ask uh, the uh, participants who are the, sorry the panelists who are here takes one or two of the questions that are already in the Q, Q and A. Why we wait for him to log in again? I hope you agree with me. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Alimi. I think that will be the best to do in the in the circumstance. So, on that note, I think we'll start with the questions that we have in the in the Q&A box um, to see how far we can go. And I would like to start with the first question, which talks about, um, okay, I think a few of them maybe, uh, okay, I'll start with the question number four, and that is to Mr. Salami, which says, are small companies liable to VAT under the act? Um, very good question. Uh, under the Act, small companies as defined in FP20, FP19, rather, are those companies whose turnover is 25 million dollar or less. So such companies are not liable to pay income tax. In the same vein, they are not required to pay. They are not liable to pay value tax and not required to file uh, file bank returns uh, every month. So the law is clear on that, and I think that's the position of the law. The only sense, like I said later on, was to basically enhance the chances of their survival, improve their profitability, and able to jumpstart 
recovery of the economy. Thank you. Okay, which is very good. So it's a continuation of what is in FA 2019. Okay, so um, there's a question on non-resident companies and it says, how do you identify, how do you identify NRCs that are expected to file tax returns? The provision of the law is clear. Um, it's it's um, a requirement that all non-resident companies, i.e. companies incorporated in other countries other than Nigeria, are required to file income tax returns in compliance with the provision of section TITA. And that provision requires them to prepare audited accounts to support such tax returns. However, where the nature of the operation in Nigeria is such that the end passive income and the total tax on that income is the final tax liability, they are then absorbed of that requirement. In other words, they are not required to file income tax returns. Once the source of their income and the total tax on it is final tax liability, they are not required to file income tax returns. So that's how to identify them. Those who earn incomes that are passive, on which the total tax is the final tax, and that is defined on the, in the law, they are not required to file income tax returns. Okay, so maybe I can just push that forward for the clarity of our audience that which kind of income is the withholding tax, the final tax? I guess the, um, the significant economic presence regulation talks about it, but just to enlighten our audience. Okay, absolutely. Under the SCP rules, incomes like management fees, technical fees, consultancy, and professional fees, there are this strata of incomes on which withholding tax on them is the final tax liability and such NRC is not required to file income tax returns in Nigeria. Okay, so thank you so much for that clarity. Um, permit me, the questions are, you know, as I, I, I try to see if I could bring them together, but there has not been enough chance. So I'll just go through them as I see them relevant. And a number of the questions are actually to the, um, to the lead speaker, Mr. Salami and Mr. Gonjubola. But as I find suitable questions for other panelists, I'll be sure to ask them. So still on with uh, Mr. Thank you. Salami. I think I'm back now. Oh, okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So we'll hand uh, over to Mr. Gojubola to continue on his discourse. Thank you. I apologize. Um, we have a general power failure. And so I've had to rely on mobile devices for um, having connection. And sometimes you can also rely on the telecom providers. Uh, so that's why we are having to speed up. My apologies again. I was trying to explain that um, the general tax principles that guided the FA 2020, as um, um, even indicated in Mr. Salami's uh, presentation, is that there will be no new taxes and there will be no new incentives. However, there are specific uh, tax objectives that we sought to achieve uh, through the FA 2020. Uh, one is to correct some unintended errors that we had in the 2019 Finance Act. Uh, for example, in section 23, um, there were some unintended errors there and, and some other places. Uh, number two uh, is to plug uh, loopholes. Um, and that's why you will find what we had in section 14, uh, have adding a new subsection five um, to clarify um, that the uh, application of section 14 is limited to free uh, uh, income. Um, another specific objective uh, was to provide the FRS with the legal uh, 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 framework to uh, introduce technology and particularly to be able to obtain information from taxpayers by connecting um, their computers to uh, the taxpayers' computers. Uh, another specific objective was to um, enable Nigeria to fulfill its obligation under the uh, existing tax treaties and multilateral conventions, uh, particularly as related to exchange of information as it relates to um, the common reporting standard, that is the automatic exchange of information, uh, and, and generally to be able to um, pass through the various uh, peer reviews uh, that Nigeria was scheduled um, to go through. Um, another objective was to provide clarity in 
a number of the uh, provisions um, by making clear definitions um, so that um, we can have improved uh, administrative efficiency and also uh, ease of compliance. Um, so th these were the general uh, objectives and specific objectives uh, as regards taxation that we sought to achieve through the FA um, 2020. Uh, I will just speak to a few of the provisions um, that uh, I believe will be of benefit uh, to all of us. Uh, number one um, is the issue of capital gains tax. Um, you will realize that there was a major uh, introduction uh, into section two uh, of, of uh, CGTA that now mandates the filing of returns, that is CGT returns, um, probably twice a year. Uh, first one, not later than 30th of June of each year, and the second one, not later than 31st uh, of uh, December, uh, where, where there is um, a disposal of chargeable um, assets. Uh, this is very significant, um, and um, I do hope that uh, stakeholders have taken particular note um, of this uh, issue. I think the second one on CGT that I also want to mention, because it's easy to, to miss, uh, is the fact that the exemption of ships and aircraft as to CGT has been amended, and it is only ships and aircrafts that are used in international traffic uh, that are exempt. Uh, any other uh, aircraft or, 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 or ships uh, that are, are operating in Nigeria uh, would be chargeable to um, capital gains tax if there are disposals. Um, let me quickly speak um, about the um, consolidated uh, relief allowance, which I had Nikkei mentioned. Um, we, we need to understand the principle. Um, it is not true that it is, uh, it's not entirely correct that it will lead to increased um, tax uh, bill for workers. Um, what the law has done um, is to match like with like. Uh, where an income item is exempt, uh, it will become double dipping. If you still base the CRA on such income, and for example, if I hand 10 million naira, and of that 10 million naira, 5 million is exempt from tax. If therefore you're going to compute my CRA, if you base it on that 10 million, then it will be double dipping in respect of the exempt income. And that is one of the loopholes that, that, that I spoke to um, that uh, as a guiding principle, uh, we were seeking to, to plug. And so it is the intention is not to increase uh, taxes, but rather to make the uh, a playing field level for everyone. Um, I will move on to um, uh, it's a fairly controversial topic, uh, and I'm happy uh, my speakers, uh, those who have spoken ahead of me, um, did not look at the negative side of it, uh, the publicity that I've attailed, uh, issue of minimum tax. Um, the reduction uh, in the minimum tax rate uh, to 0.25% 0 .25 is only for two years. That is one. Number two is that um, there is a drafting error uh, in that section 33 and that amendment uh, because effectively what we have now um, is a, a relief for one year. Um, that is 2021 year of assessment. But this matter had been taken up with the Office of the Minister of Finance and uh, an amendment has been pro proposed um, such that taxpayers to have that relief for 2021 year of assessment and 2022 year of assessment. But the reference to 2020 year, uh, uh, finance year uh, in that um, year of assessment in that law was an error, an unintended error, which 
uh, is going to be corrected hopefully uh, uh, before the end of the year. Um, permit me to speak to section 55. Um, there are two notable amendments in section 55. Um, one is the amendment with respect to uh, filing of returns by non-Nigerian companies. Um, now they are required to provide full returns um, just like every Nigerian company. Uh, but in addition to the returns of the Nigerian operation, they are also required to provide the uh, global account to support um, the Nigerian operations account. Um, this is very significant um, because we believe that we sh should um, treat every taxpayer equally, whether a Nigerian uh, 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 entity or a non-Nigerian entity. Um, with respect to the other amendment, it, uh, it starts to do with um, the um, ability of the FRS under the law now to prescribe a simplified return for small and medium-sized companies. And I, I believe this is a very significant um, introduction um, as we are talking about um, ease of doing business, about ease of compliance. Uh, one of the ways we could achieve that is also to simplify uh, returns, particularly for small businesses um, who uh, hopefully will we may not be required um, to provide this kind of report that a large company uh, uh, will be providing. Um, okay. I, I will do a quick jump to uh, value added tax. Okay, we are running um, out of time. The, okay, all right, I can stop here. Thank you, Nick. Maybe we can quickly take the value added tax. All right, and, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I, it, it's just important that we note that um, there, are, there are a few significant introductions to the VAT Act, uh, particularly um, the change to Section 2, uh, which has clearly uh, brought into the fore the destination principle uh, in, in VAT um, to say that any item consumed in Nigeria uh, will become um, liable to VAT in Nigeria. Um, also, introduction of Section 2A, uh, which is the uh, time of supply rules, um, uh, the, which is also very, very significant, uh, which I also believe that taxpayers uh, must take note of um, so that we have clear understanding of, of the law. Um, I think, uh, let me stop here, Nick, in, in, in view of time. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gwajibola. I believe if you had the old day, you can really go on and you know share with us um, the insights of the regulator in terms of the changes that have come in to the, um, to the tax laws through the Finance Act 2020. So we thank you. And at this point, um, we'll formally go into the Q&A session. We attempted to start it while you were, when we had the little break in transmission. And so what we'll be doing essentially is continuing on the questions that we have been asking. And I think because Mr. Gwajibala was speaking and you have touched on some of critical points, especially to clarify in terms of the consolidated relief and allowance, which is a burning issue for a lot of um, taxpayers, individual taxpayers, and then the minimum tax rate that I think I'll just start with you and ask some of the questions that we have here. So I have a question in terms of the exemption of minimum wage earners from income tax. And the person asked that, does it apply to individuals that are not in paid employment who earn amounts equivalent to the minimum wage? So essentially I'm hearing that individuals that may not be in the formal sector, so to speak. Yeah, for, for, for individuals, uh, I mean, the, the law specifically says uh, minimum wage. And we all know that the minimum wage is also a product of the Minimum Wage Act. So um, based on the definition of minimum wage in that act, that is the limitation. Um, but one thing we, we, we have taken note of those comments before and our plan uh, in-house is um, to look at um, the, the Finance Act 2021 
um, to be able to make it very clear. Um, but again, we are going to have to do that in consultation with the Ministry of Finance, who has the responsibility for tax policy. Um, and if the intention is, is to actually have a, a, um, a monetary threshold, um, in which case it's not going to be whether you earn it as, um, a, as a wage or you earn it in, in your profession or trade or business. Okay, thank you very much. I will ask the second and third question to Mr. Bojibala to so as to just give him a bucket to respond to. And there's a question on VAT that what should people do as some FRS officers insist on intimidating people to pay VAT on sale of house, despite the fact that it was never in the law, even after the Finance Act expressly stated so. So especially particularly with the Finance Act 2020, which clarifies that there should be no VAT. Do we expect FRS to still insist on this issue? VAT on sale of properties or VAT on rental of um, commercial properties? I think it would be nice to hear a categorical, categorical statement from you, Mr. Bojbola. Well, th thanks very much. Um, I, I think um, that, that is not a question that, I mean, my view that is... Uh, um, Sorry, there's some background noise. Thank you. Yes, there is. I don't know where that is coming from. Please, can we I all mute from, our phones, please? I, I, think, so. you, you, I think Chief Okuna was a um, microphone. <laughs> yeah, and one thing I was wanting to do, I was having a question. Okay, so you can continue, Mr. Bojibala. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I was saying that that should not be a difficult uh, um, issue. Um, knowing that taxation is a matter of law, strictly speaking, and, and to that extent, um, the FRS cannot go outside the law um, to impose tax. So if the law had said an item is exempt, it is exempt. And I think um, from what we have in the FA 2020, it is clear uh, that land and building are exempt. Interest in land interest in building are exempt. And to that extent, FRS cannot level VAT on those items. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for that categorical statement. And I'm sure a lot of our audience have, will be, are very happy to hear that and they can plan their affairs accordingly. Then last but not the least for now that I'd like to ask you is a question which um, is on the minimum tax and that despite the reduction from 0.5, to 0.25%. There are categories of sectors or uh, operators or companies whereby they only earn marginal income on the turnover that they receive. Like sometimes it's just mere commission because they carry out sales on behalf of their principals, they are just agents. So they end up having huge turnover, but the amount as it relates to it is just a fraction, might be 5% or even less in many cases. So that how can you, in this case, the person is a bureau de change, and give an illustration whereby his sales can be like 500 million. And you know, his cost of sale is almost the same amount. The only commission he makes out of like that 500 million turnover is barely 3 million. And that how will his minimum tax be calculated? We know what is in the law, but I think maybe the question for you is that, how does the, um, how does the law or how does FRS see this? And what do we expect for people who only make marginal um, income from the high turnovers they have? Because this uh, minimum tax um, provision at 0.25 of turnover can seem quite punitive for such individuals. So your, your response will be, your perspective will be useful. Yeah, yeah thanks very much. Um, like we, all, we, like we um, I believe all of us are on the same page that tax is a matter of the law. Uh, and, and according to, uh, I think it's Lord um, uh, Dennis, I'm not sure now if I'm, if I'm sure. Uh, who said there's no intendment in tax? Um, uh, it, 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 nothing is to be re read in, nothing is to be read out. So, so we need to just walk by the law. Um, I, I can spot the, um, the challenge in the current legislation um, as regard minimum tax, um, particularly where we have um, businesses that um, are trading on very thin margin. Um, but they are not said, they are not identified in this law. Um, everyone is lumped into the same bag. And the question then is, from the policy side of it, should we not be segregated? Uh, but that we can't answer that question now uh, because what we have in the law as of today 
has to be implemented the way it is. But going into the future amendments, this will have to be areas uh, where we have to uh, beam our searchlight and see how we are fair to those kind of businesses. Okay, so thank you for that clarity. We we'll look forward to such amendments coming into the Finance Act 2021, you know, so that they can address this on undecided issue. So thank you very much, Mr. Bojbola. I'll move to Mr. Yosalami um, to continue some of our earlier questions. And I think I was trying to ask you as at that time, a question that one of our audience have asked in terms of clarification, if VAT is exempted from transportation services as well as the purchase of transportation vehicles, because your presentation did mention exemption on vehicles. So he's asking whether transportation services also has exemption from VAT. Okay, thank you very much, Nikkei. But before I answer that question, I thought it's important that I provide a bit of context again to the response by Mr. Mojibola regarding the question around them um, being among which, um, why, why? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was uh, using the same line for um, a meeting, so that's why I couldn't pick your call. No, that's all. Hello, Mr. Mojibola. Okay. Mr. Mojibola, okay. are you with us? I think can Sorry, Nikkei, are you expecting something from me? We were hearing you, so we weren't sure whether you were referring to us. No, I'm sorry. My apologies. Okay. I've muted my microphone now. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Okay. Salami wants to respond to um, the issue of minimum which you spoke about. So over to Mr. Salami. So I was going to say that um, the reference to whether minimum which and us were exempted from minimum tax will also apply to people in private um, in private organizations or sole traders and all of that. I think the real problem was the way the law was worded in F20 with the proviso that ended with, with um, people in paid employment. And I think that's where the issue is. Um, so while the Samuel and the FRS team um, are trying to propose or um, suggest to the Fiscal Policy Reform Committee an amendment to that section so that it can apply across board, my sense is that what they need to do is simply remove that proviso mm. regarding paid employment, people in paid employment. If that is removed, I think that cost is sufficient to apply to all people who earn non wage and below across board, irrespective of whether they are in paid employment or private employment. So back to the question around whether VAT is also applicable or exempt regarding um, transport services. I think the wording of the law is clear. Um, it's, 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 um, it's not, it only applies to transportation vehicles imported um, um, in, uh, into, the, into the country, and then the airline tickets sold by airlines operating in Nigeria, that is what is exempt from VAT. Some of the services themselves are not exempt from VAT, based on the portion of the law. What the law has done is to say, if you import motor vehicles that, um, uh, you, that, that can ca ca carry more than, more than 10 people and so on and so forth, they do not qualify for import duty. Respect to VAT, it's only airline tickets that are exempt. Other transport services are not exempt from VAT. I think that question is important. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for that clarity. And I'm sure uh, uh, the, the, the person who asked this will be guided very well. So on to another question, Mr. Salami still on VAT and asking that a small enterprise that was previously registered for VAT, can they simply stop the obligation to file returns if they are, if they are not obligated under FA 2020 or whether FA 2019, given that their turnover is 25 million or below? So what do they do if they've been previously registered? Can they just go off from that point onwards? Thank you very much for that question. The origin of the law is clear on this, and it says that um, they, are, they are absorbed from any filing and obligation as well as registration obligation. So what I would suggest is that um, they can write to the FRS and indicate what their turnover level is and advise the FRS that they will stop filing the tax returns pending when they eat that minimum milestone of 25 million naira in sales. And I think it's clear. I'm not sure the FRS would them would them have any issues with that. The only thing is that once they hit that threshold of 25 million, they can then begin or resume the filing of their tax returns. They may not necessarily deregister because I guess the hope 
for such business owners is to grow in the economy. So they might just suspend filing pending when they eat that milestone and then they gone begin to, to fight as returns. Thank you. Okay, very well, very well. And um, seems to be there are, que there are questions that love uh, motor vehicles and the rest, because um, this question is also on cars, but it's on duties. And it says that, um, that the reading of the law suggests, seems to suggest that the 5% reduction only applies to cars used for commercial transport. Is that correct? Um, I think so, but maybe there are more clarity you can provide. No, not at all. There are categories in the law, and the one that applies to uh, motor vehicles, cars in specific, it also reduced from 30% to 5%, if I recall very well. So it's not, um, there's no confusion about it. Um, it's clear, and then, um, yes, it's, it's, um, it's import levy on cars, it starts from 30% to 5%. Cars are those that um, you and I use. The one motor vehicles for transportation is the one where we have the caveat that it must be for vehicles imported vehicles that can transport 10 and people, 10 and more of passengers. That one was reduced from um, 10 from 35% to 10%. So there are different categories. It's not lumped together. Okay, very well. So our speaker can be, or our questionnaire can be, uh, the person who asked the question can be happy that the cars that are used, even if it's not for commercial purposes, we similarly enjoyed this exemption. Um, what timeline, this question goes, what timeline, what is the timeline for when the unclaimed dividend will be taken from quoted companies? So question, is there clarity right now in terms of the framework for the implementation of transfers of the unclaimed dividend from companies to the fund that has been set up by the government? Yes, based on the provision of FA20, there are clear guidelines, although I know that um, more details might come from the DMO, who are supposed to manage this process. And the guideline is that um, six years after such dividends have been declared and are not claimed by their beneficiaries, the corporate entity who is um, a public quoted company on the NSC is required by law to then transmit such amount to the unclaimed dividends and fund account managed by the DMO. So, so far, that's the guideline we have. And I think in terms of more details, that may come from DMO as they work that portion of the law. So I think it's clear. Thank you. OK. This question goes on about um, the cost of tracking on claim dividend yearly increase the cost for the quoted companies. So that, please, how does the cost of tracking the on claim dividend yearly, how does it increase the cost for the quoted companies? I guess this is talking about the administrative cost involved in um, trying to identify the owners of the unclaimed dividend so that they can come forward and claim it before the funds are eventually transferred to the government. I'm not sure there's anything we can do about it at this point. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. so... I think it's a question of um, each quoted company liaising with its registrars to then put up a structure to track that and monitor it on a regular basis. But definitely, they've got to dedicate a resource to track that because I suppose some of them have shareholders in their thousands and hundreds of thousands, which means that um, they really need to do a lot of um, admin work to track. Thank you. Okay. I think the last but not the least one on dividends is an issue about the legal implications of government taking both dormant accounts and unclaimed dividend monies that do not belong to the government. Um, I'm not sure we can also deal with legal implications here, but the law is the law. So I think if, it's, if the government is doing it in line with what is codified in the Finance Act 2020, it's not going to be illegal. But if Mr. Salami, you'd like to add some perspective, we, I will be very welcome to receive it. I guess this is an issue that um, has dominated the space in the last uh, couple of uh, weeks after the law was passed. But I guess a question of, do we want to stay with status quo where after 12 years, companies are at liberty to then um, recoup back that unclaimed dividend into the general profit pool and distribute amongst living shareholders as it were. And I think, like I said, that is contrary to the position of um, the Constitution of Nigeria, which frowns at uh, people taking other people's property illegally, because that's what it turned, what, what might turn out to be. So I think the new dispensation, where the government is saying, after six years, transfer such unclaimed events into a pool of funds, which is a debt owed by the government to those people. They are not taking those money and then just just um, uh, spending it without a cost. So it's a debt, and the beneficiaries of that uh, of those dividends can come back and claim it 
having proved their ownership of it. So it's not as if the government is um, appropriating that amount and to, to itself without any obligation to refund it. It's a debt owed to the government, which will be managed by the GMO. And at any point in time, when those beneficiaries come up to prove their claim, they are intent to to the money plus any profit that might have put on, on, such, on such profit. Thank you. Absolutely. And I like um, the person who asked to remember what Mr. Salami had also said during the presentation in terms of that this, uh, the law has been properly set up. And yes, it's debt that is owed um, by the federal government to, to the individuals. And that so you can always claim it later on. There was another point I was trying to remember which you said during the course, but I'll come back to it as it comes back to me again. So I'd like to quickly move on to the question we have here on VAT, but I think it's nice to still ask it so that um, the caller can get a specific response. But I think comment from Mr. Bojibola has addressed it. And it goes that with the FA 2020, can my company accept an office and warehouse rent invoice for 2021 with VAT charge? Hello? Mr. Salami, yeah. did you hear me? No, can you tell me again? It says, can my company accept an, a, a rental invoice for 2021 that has a VAT charge? Can, can the company accept it? Yes, with a VAT oh, charge. Of course not, because um, going forward from 2021 January 1st, uh, such is deemed to be interest in land or building, which is exempt from VAT. So I would advise that uh, such invoice be returned and properly um, re 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 prepared and sent to the, to the, to the corporate taxpayer okay. without VAT. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for that. Yeah, the comment I wanted to make was on the constitution in terms of this unclaimed dividend. And I think the provision in the constitution we had alluded to, which says that a property of an individual does not expunge. So what the government is trying to do is really with the 12 years limitation, it's like you denying people a right that belongs to them. But with this new provision, your right will per for perpetually will be yours, which can be claimed anytime you come forward. So thank you very much. And then moving to the next question on CIT, uh, it's, with, it's with relations to new companies that are caught between the commencement rule of the old tax law and the newly introduced rule by the Finance Act. How do they go about their tax computation and filing of returns? Thank you very much for that uh, question. I must confess that um, it's not an easy one. So you are looking at um, the interjection between old law and a new law. Um, my, my sense is that um, we will have to look at the specific situation of that taxpayer. Under the old law, the second and third taxpayer are the ones that um, basically have um, the taxpayer as option to choose the one whichever provides and um, gives the lower tax stability. So if the second and the third tax year incidentally then falls into the new regime, then it might also mean that uh, you just begin to apply the new law, which is a later law, as, as, as lawyers would say. So that's my sense. But again, specifics will be important so that uh, you, can have, you, can get, you can be well guided. Okay, so please, um, the person who asked it, if you would like further clarification or advice, you are very much welcome to approach us in KPMG and we'll be happy to guide you through your returns. Now, still on commencement, but now it's in terms of the Finance Act 2020. And the question goes that when do we commence applying FA 2020? Is it on audited accounts with 20, 20 audited account for 2019, which is 2020 year of assessment, or audited accounts for 2020, which is 2021 year of assessment? If we reference this to FA 2020, which is the subject matter of discussion, um, based on the provision of that law, it will apply with respect to accounting year 2020 going forward. In other words, Absolutely. our tax law is based on business year basis for corporate income tax. So it applies to accounting year 2020 going forward, while any VAT amendment will apply on a prospective basis from January going forward. forward. So that is 2021 year of assessment that it becomes applicable. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, so I have another question this on VAT and it asks you to kindly confirm 
if the zero VAT on tractor leasing is applicable to oil and gas industry, service industry, oil and gas service industry to be specific? I don't, can you take the question again? We should confirm if the zero VAT on tractor leasing is applicable to the oil and gas servicing industry. I think the law is clear. If you look at the, the second schedule, it, um, it, it doesn't, it's specific to a uh, big sector. I remember very well, but I can recheck that and then maybe get back to the question after this um, webinar. Absolutely. So we'll get back to you on that, but it's likely applicable to the um, agricultural industry. Okay, so this question is on the telecom sector and that what players in the sector will be burdened with the newly introduced exercise duty? And will the excise duty increase the base of VAT, i.e. are we going to add excise duty to the invoice value before computing VAT? Do we have clarities on the modalities at this stage? I would say not yet. What FA20 has provided is a framework for the president to impose that levy and the modalities for that will be spelled out in uh, subsequent um, guidelines from the president. So as of now, what the FA has done is also alert the public that um, going forward, telecom services will be accessible um, at a rate and modality to be spelled out by the president um, um, any, any time from now. So we don't know the details yet for now. Okay, thank you. I'm looking at the time. I think we'll just take um, questions we can address within the next five minutes. And for those we are not able to address, we will respond to them and subsequently get back to our audience. We have your email addresses, so we'll be able to send you responses to questions we are not able to take at this, um, at this webinar. Okay, so minimum tax again. And the, the, the person asking the question is trying to clarify that with the new provisions of the minimum tax, does it apply now, even before you give yourself the four year exemption for minimum tax, which the law already provides for? So from your year one, if you make losses, do you start paying minimum tax or you are exempted first from the first four years of your operations? Does that exemption still apply or minimum tax starts applying from year one? If you look at the wording of the introduction to that section last year, it basically abrogated those um, conditions. And what it means is that um, it will begin to apply uh, from first, first year of operation. So those conditions um, that give exemptions are no longer applicable. In, in essence, it will begin to apply from um, the first year, if I recall, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Mr. Salami. And uh, we have a question here in terms of, okay, again, it's on this inter crisis intervention fund that are there legal frame, are, are the legal framework, are there legal framework or adequate systems put in place for the recovery stroke repayment of people's money held in trust in the crisis intervention fund? So do we have a framework at all? Those are details that are still being worked out in terms of what will be done. Absolutely, absolutely. What FA has, FA20 has done is to provide a framework for operation of um, that um, intervention fund. More details will be issued by DMO who are saddled with responsibility to manage the fund with respect to how we are gonna do that, the process for making the claim and, and all of that. So for now, details are yet to be known. Thank you. Okay. I seem to have a number of questions that are similar to what have been addressed. So I'm trying to run through them to see those that are unique so that we can spend the many few minutes on them. Okay, there's a question, even though it was to the tax authority, but um, I'm not sure Mr. Godjibola is with us. So I'll just end up my questions with you, Mr. Salami. And the question goes that, can we claim credit as a result of the reduction in the minimum tax rates? Absolutely, we can claim the credit pending when a new law is um, pronounced to correct the error Mr. Mondiwala admitted was made in the drafting of the current law. So before, um, pending when the law is pronounced, we can 
um, absolutely claim a credit because at the law as it is today is that um, reference was made to tax year rather than accounting year. I mean, that, that's my sense. But immediately the new law is pronounced, then the ability to claim that credit may be lost if that law is um, validated. Thank you. Okay, so I think we've heard it all because, um, no, I'm not Sorry, ended, but I'm just saying, hello. Oh, yeah, yeah with I us. Actually, I actually raised my hand. Um, Forgive me. I think that question, um, I think it's good to clarify it um, to taxpayers so that they are not um, uh, mistaken. Um, I, I don't understand what the uh, questioner is talking about um, being um, a set of, or um, I'm not sure I understand, but I can only think maybe, um, can I get a, a credit against my 2020 year of assessment um, tax, uh, which by now um, will have been closed? Uh, if that is the question, uh, the answer will be a definite no. Uh, no, um, because tax laws are never made in retrospect. Um, so you can't be in 2021, you are making tax law for 2020 year of assessment. So um, if, if the question is whether, oh, can I get now go to FRS and get a credit and say, look, I overpaid it in 2020 year of assessment, the answer is a definite no. Um, and, and that's why in my statement, I, I made it clear that even though the intention of the law is to provide for two year relief, effectively it has cut it to one. Um, however, the intention is to remedy that by uh, ensuring that uh, in 2022, um, that relief is available. I just, it's just important to make that clarity, thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Bojubola. Um... I think it's a bit um, of an issue that we, it may have to also be examined because if the law is never changed and it's the wordings of the law, then the question is, is a tax as a taxpayer aid by claiming those credit for 2020? Because as the law stands today, that is what is written in it. So I, I think that's an issue that also has to be borne in mind. The change may not be made till the end of the year. And so really, especially taxpayers that may not have even filed their 2020 year of assessment for any reason. Are they, would they have gone uh, wrong it, if they do that? So, <laughs> yeah, they, 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 have they not gone wrong if a tax we have not filed 2020 year of assessment return as at now? There will be a penalty <laughs> for law. that, but that is another regime. There's a penalty regime for that, but then the question is in no, no tax, tax return, what is in the tax no. loss or what is in the law as at today? But I guess it's not something right. we can solve here, but I think we understand the spirit in which Mr. Bojubola has expressed that it wasn't meant to be there. So the advice would be that you should be corrected as quickly as possible, because so long as it's still there, this will be the exact provisions of the law as are today. So please, FRS, um, ensure that it is duly corrected if it's not meant to be there, so that there's no confusion for our taxpayers. So I'll say thank you. I think I'll just take two more questions um, before we now take the vote of thanks. And um, I have a question, sorry, in filing that Mr. Salami, that an international humanitarian organization, are, human, are international humanitarian organizations expected to register and file CAT, but more importantly, VAT and CIT. So maybe you can, you can shed more light on the taxation. And if Mr. Godwala is still with us, you can just share his perspective as well. Yeah, I think in a way, um, such organizations typically have some exemptions from um, see two school laws in any country that they operate. So we need to look at the specific international organization and the charter that brought them into the country before we can make categorical statements about them. But generally, um, institutions that are of um, public character in nature are not expected to uh, pay income tax and then they're exempted from some, some of these tax obligations. But specifically, we need to look at the details of such international organizations, the charter set them up in Nigeria, and whether there are any specific incentives offered by the government of the country to them before we can make a um, categorical statement as to their tax status. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Mr. Gwajibola, or do you have uh, do you want to make any comments in terms of FRS's views on humanitarian organizations? Well, well if we are talking about registration for tax, no organization is exempt from registering for tax and obtaining TIN. And it actually is obligatory, including governments uh, must register for tax and get TIN. Um, when it comes to a, a payment of tax system, we also now need to be clear. If we are talking about income tax, there are specific rules 
um, that we guide that. And I agree with Mr. Salami that uh, we also have to refer to the charter um, that, that um, of, uh, makes the organization to operate in Nigeria. Uh, but when it comes to transaction taxes um, or, 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 or taxes um, uh, uh, we are in, the entity will have obligations as an agent of government. Uh, I'm not sure any organization is exempt. Okay. All right, thank you. So the treaties will guide us and we've heard the preliminary view so we can do more work on that for the person that asked the question to final and to clarify that. So last but not the least question we will take now is regarding a very simple question on CGT. Is it applicable to all companies? Please, can we shed light? So Mr. Salami, you can go first and Mr. Gojibola can add any comments on that. Thank you. The CGT acts applies to all companies and individuals yes. who dispose charitable assets in any tax year. So once you dispose charitable assets as an individual or as a corporate entity, you are supposed to charge CGT on any charitable gains realized from that asset. So it's simple. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Salami. And to Mr. Gojibola. Okay, I don't think- uh, so, Sorry, Nikkei, I, I actually lost you. Yeah, it was a simple question on CGT and the caller was asking if it was applicable to all companies. And Mr. Salami just clarified now that it's applicable to all companies and individuals. So I thought Absolutely. maybe to ask FRS for a concurrence on that. Okay. All right, so thank you very much. And we spent over 30 minutes and our time is fast spent. So we've come to the end of the Q&A session. There are still a number of questions <clears throat> that have not been addressed. And like I said, we'll go through them. If they are not repetition of questions already addressed, we will send the responses to the participants. So at this point, I would like to call on Mr. Dele Alami to help give us the vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Over to you, Mr. Alami. Sorry, we can't hear you, Mr. Alimi. My apologies, I was actually muted. Um, thank you very much. It's been a wonderful and um, robust session. I want to thank you for the wonderful way you have moderated the session. And um, uh, I have a simple task here and uh, I want to, on behalf of uh, the Institute and uh, KPMG, thank our lead speaker uh, Mr. Yosalami, uh, we are very appreciative of the very uh, insighted paper that you gave. It actually uh, broke down the uh, Financial Act 2020. And I think from the comment I've seen in the in the comment uh, uh, box, uh, people really uh, gained very well from that uh, presentation. I also want to thank uh, our panelists. Uh, first, I want to thank Mr. Sonia Gonjubola, uh, the Director of Tax uh, Policy uh, the, of FIRS Nigeria. I want to say a very big thank you for answering our call and for being very open and upfront with information at this uh, event. And of course, to Mr. Ogaga Ologe, uh, the CFO of Cadbury Nigeria PLC, I want to, on behalf of the organization, say a very big thank you to you too for being part of this event. Uh, to Mr. Akisho Mondaudu, the regional head of South Africa of uh, Citibank. I also want to say a big thank you on behalf of the organizers uh, that you heed, you heeded our call. Say a very big thank you. And of course, to our very able moderator, uh, Ms. Uh, Nikke James, uh, he, the, the success of this program today is not unconnected with how well you've been able to manage the various uh, Point, especially the questions. At the moment, I can still see questions coming in. We have 63, 63 questions still here to be answered. But I'm sure, uh, like you promised, when we look at those questions, we'll be sending answers to the participants. So I want to say a very big thank you to you. Uh, this partnership has been very fruitful. And from the comment I've seen from the participants, they really appreciated what has been done today. And of course, to the, uh, the head chief of the two organizations, uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Elibute for his wonderful um, uh, welcome remark. And of course, I want to thank the president of the Institute of Directors Nigeria, Chief Chris Okuno. Uh, we thank you very much, Mr. President, for being present here, for delivering a very insightful paper. 
Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, our participants, I want to thank you all. At the point, we are at about 400. I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody. And I want to thank you for being a very active uh, 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 participant, being very active participants, because the questions were quite, uh, were quite uh, insightful and uh, it also taxed our panelists. So I want to thank everyone and for the uh, staff of the two organizations who, in the last three, four weeks, I've been exchanging emails, been discussing. I want to say a very big thank you to you. I can't mention all the names, but let me let you know. I want to let you know that you are all well appreciated. You ensure that this worked out very well for everybody. And I want to uh, tell you that, uh, well, this, was, this is not our first time of collaborating. And of course, we will never stop collaborating. That is KPLG and IOD Nigeria to ensure that we continue to deliver on our mandate of keeping uh, members, even non-members informed and helping you to deliver on your role as directors of organizations. So uh, on behalf of everybody, I want to say thank you. And I want to wish you a very wonderful day. Please continue to keep safe. COVID-19 is still very much around. Continue to keep safe, continue to uh, go by all the protocols. May the good Lord be with us. Thank you very much. Over to you, Nike. Okay, so thank you very much, Mr. Alimi, for that very warm vote of thanks, and we appreciate everybody. So till the, till the next time IOD is organizing an event or KPNG or a collaboration between the two organizations, we wish you all well, and uh, we close the event at this, at this point. So do have a good day and stay safe. Bye. Bye, Nike. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Mr. President, Bye. thank you very much. Bye, sir. Thank you. Mr. Bojibola. Mr. Kojiwala, is he there? Uh, has he, has he moved he on? I think he may have dropped off. I can't see him. Oh, OK. All right. OK. Uh, please, uh, DG, try and yes, make contact sir. with him. Make contact okay. with him, OK? okay Thank you very much. Ayo, very kind of you, as always. Catch you later. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. God Thank bless you. Eh? Thank you God so much. You. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.